It is an interesting thing that we go through as parents. The newborn comes along and we are constantly saying things that we want them to say. Mama, Daddy, and we keep hoping, oh, did I hear it? Did I hear the first word? And we spend all of that time waiting for them to talk. And once they begin, we start teaching them to be quiet. You notice that? That's a fascinating way that it works. Well, these young people, every year we get to do this, and every year our seniors provide a verse that we use to describe some things about them, but to give us a spiritual lesson. So they've been talking. I want you during this time to think about what you have seen in some of these young people and notice how it fits with the concept of tonight. Before I give you the theme, let's think first about this. God has been in the business for a long time of using children as images of great spiritual lessons. One of the greatest Psalms surely must be Psalm 8. We know how it begins, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And then we come to these words, for out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because, notice, because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avengers. He goes on then to give us words about the existence of God. Things that we can see and know about who God is. Passage you've heard many times. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you visited him, you made him a little lower than the angels with glory and honor you crowned him. You've made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, and all that passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord... Our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. That great psalm of the existence of God began with God saying, I put this in the mouths of babes and infants to destroy the enemy. In some ways, that's tough to understand. But the concept of babe and infant means those who are younger, yes. I also think to understand this passage for me, it makes sense to see that these are those who have not been corrupted by the world in their natural state in which God has given them. They believe in God. They have a moral sense about them that the world will break down if we're not careful. For many years, working with the Family Resource Center at Daniel Boone School, every year we would take a group of the kids who needed clothes to the clothing bank. And they would get to pick their own clothes and this was a big deal for them. And these are third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders. Here's what amazed me. They would want to try those things on. But in their natural state, every single one of them 
would tell me, you need to leave so I can take my shirt off, those boys said. And the women working with the girls, they were told the same thing. In their natural state, they just understood a basic moral principle that the world is going to break down over time. There's something about children who just believe in God. They've not figured out that they shouldn't. Oftentimes, there are things that people believe from Scripture that you just cannot get unless you are taught that. You can't go into Scripture and find out some of those things. But out of the mouths of babes, God used children throughout Scripture. Jesus in Matthew 18 said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I think he's talking about that basic created innocence. Oh, now we must admit, Matthew chapter 11, that he also uses children to say, oh, but remember, they are still immature. That passage of Matthew 11 where Jesus is talking about John the baptizer and he's asking, what did you go out to see? A man in soft clothing? What did you go out to see? A man shaken by the wind? And he goes on to say, this man was one of the greatest ever. And then he looked at all of those people who rejected John the baptizer and he said, you, this generation, you're like children who stand around and they blow on their flutes and they ask people to dance. Or they stand around and ask you to weep and mourn. The games of the children in those, that time, they mocked the adults who going to a wedding ceremony would walk down the streets piping with their flutes, singing, dancing, or when there was a funeral procession, they would walk together and mourn and weep and grieve. And now these children are saying, we're playing a game. Dance with us, sing with us, mourn and weep with us, and then get upset when nobody would do it. You people, he said, you expected John to be a certain way, and when he wasn't that way, you rejected him. You expect me, Jesus, to be a certain way, Now I'm not that way, and you rejected me, just like children in their immaturity might do, selfishly do what I want you to do. So God uses the image of children often to give us biblical lessons. Tonight, from the verses that these young people have given, the theme that I notice is influence. Think with me about influence. Generally, first, in my head, I'm thinking of moments of influence from these young people. I can't help. But think of the moments of influence when Camden Mackinnon first stood behind that podium after he obeyed the gospel and how we thought it was so cool, had that little stool that he and Ron Murray shared. And that was so cool. <laughs> I think about what happened when all of a sudden the convergence of Jesse and Dustin and Eric, there was an energy, there was a power that was generated from those three that not only did the youth see, but everybody else saw it too, didn't you? And I think about the influence and the growth of Caitlin Longwith. 
the little girl that didn't want to talk to you. And you look at her table, all the awards from Lads to Leaders. And by the way, she just received this week the theater award for her school. I didn't see that coming. I'm not sure anybody did. But the influence of these young people we have seen, and they have been influenced by us. With these verses, think about the influence. Number one, we get the definition of proper influence. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Here we find out that we are people who must practice pure religion. To have proper influence, proper influence demands a pure religion. You cannot say that if you don't control your tongue, you cannot say that I am a, a pure religion person. You got to control yourself. But then pure religion creates proper influence because there in James chapter 1, pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, the orphans, and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Proper influence begins by saying, I understand what proper religion before God is. And then proper religion creates a proper influence that everybody can see because you are unspotted from the world. You are visiting, helping, involved with those who are in need. That's the influence of a Christian. And that's what the definition of proper influence is. We then consider the influence that God has on us. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses saw this bush that was burning but it was not being consumed. And he, as anyone would, went over to check out what this phenomenon was. And as he drew near, a voice from the fire said, do not draw near and take off the sandals from your feet for the ground on which you stand is holy. In that moment, Moses saw the influence that God should have on the life of a person. Don't come near. There is, by definition, a gap between us and God because He is holy. And we are not until He makes us holy. That influence of the power of God, the influence of the presence of God, that is, is a, an influence that should make us say, okay, there is a distance here between us. Number two, why did he say take off your shoes? Well, it was a, it's a custom now in that part of the country and part of the world that you take your shoes off in someone's house a sign of respect, or when you go into the house to worship, you take them off. I wonder, in our place, in our time, it's more been connected to wearing a hat for the men. I grew up in a time when men did not wear hats inside a building because it was disrespectful. In fact, there was a football coach by the name of Bum Phillips who coached the Houston Oilers and when they be moved into the Astrodome, he quit wearing his cowboy hat on the sidelines because he was taught that in a building you don't wear a hat. What is it about take off the hat and take off the shoes? I think it's a reminder that we are laid open and bare before God. There is that distance 
He knows us inside and out, and the removal of those things says, yes, I am bare and open before God. God's presence should create this influence that we understand from Him in His presence. But number three, in His power. In Luke 18, Jesus said, With God, all things are possible. Nothing shall be impossible. With the power of God, we can see influence. He had just been talking to people, and he said, If you are rich, it is hard for you to get into heaven, hard for you to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples said, Who then can be saved? And Jesus said, With men it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. What is saying is he saying number one a rich person can't go to heaven no is he saying that the only way for a rich person to go to heaven is for God to let him in well no I think he's contrasting the person who puts his trust in what money can do for them versus those who put trust in what Jesus can do for them the rich In the New Testament, in Jesus' time, when Jesus referred to the rich, he was not talking about how much money they had. He was talking about where did they put their trust? Who were the rich? It wasn't about their bank account. It was about what they trusted. Where did they put their confidence? Where did they in their hearts or from what others saw? Where was their trust? The power of God is this. That influence should tell me that if I put my complete trust in Him, then I can do everything that He wants me to do, even if it seems impossible. Because I trust in Him. We have to admit that there is power in the influence of others. Power that comes from the influence of others. And we have to be careful because that power can be both good and it can be difficult. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But he, but the companion that is of fools, will be destroyed. Verse 28 of Proverbs 13. There is a power in the influence that others have on us. Some will walk with the fools, and they will become foolish. Others will spend time with the wise, and they will be rewarded. And this verse from one of our seniors might be for that person to say, as I'm heading off to college, launching out for the first time on my own, my parents aren't going to be there to verify every single person that I put into my life. So I better be aware. I better pick out who the wise people are. And try to avoid those that I come to understand are foolish. But finally, we think about the proper use of the influence that each of us has. This verse was told to me as the person's favorite verse. And I said when I was growing up, And I said it for as long as I thought I could get away with it as my favorite verse when somebody reminded me it doesn't apply to you anymore. Let no one despise your youth. Well, I got news for that person. It does apply to me. Cameron said so this morning. Camden said so this morning. Did you remember that? The youngest of the group was me. Remember that? He was not talking about the color of my beard. He was talking about the youth of my heart. You know what? It still applies to me, and it can still apply to you. 
because you can be young at heart. What have we been talking about? Children are those who put their trust in God in their innocence. That's who the children are in Scripture. And if God wants us to be His children to enter into heaven, then He's talking about who are we in our hearts. Let no one despise your youth, but you be an example to the believers, word, in conduct, in spirit, in faith, in love, in purity. We have an influence. You have an influence. And we must use that influence. Because God expects us to influence others for the good, to overcome the influence for the bad that they might try to give us. I appreciate how these verses seemed to fit well with this concept of influence. And I am convinced with these young people as they leave us, we're going to hear some really great things about them. We're going to hear some positive things that come from them being an influence where they are doing what they're doing. And that influence will be there because their families invested in them. They caught them for God. And then they released them to be an influence. And they will be an influence partly because of this church, the activities, the teaching, the service opportunities that we've given and provided, we get to take some of the credit for their good influence. But mostly, that influence is going to be determined by each one of them and what they decide to do and how well they decide to influence. And we will be back here constantly encouraging and waiting for them to come back home and share good news. I appreciate these seniors and the influence that they have been to me and I'm, I'm certain to you. The greatest influence ever, of course, was the cross of Jesus. He had said in John 3, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Will you think for just a moment of various religious groups and cults whose influence is not drawing, but rather shaming forcing, driving people to them. That was never Jesus' goal. He wanted to draw people. And the image of the cross should be an influence to draw us to Him. If that influence has yet not drawn you? Do you? Why? Why are we not drawn by the cross to say, I want to be a child of God, to be immersed into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins? Why? If I am stubbornly pursuing my own way, is the cross not drawing me and influencing me for the better. The invitation song, as it has been termed through all of life, is intended as an influence, a draw to encourage someone who might need to do what's right. And we offer that now. Meet our shepherds here as we stand and sing together. <laughs>